this is Indian Country Today. Esquili, yes, eh. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Dalahungva. A setback for the Lummi Nation in its battle to fight the coronavirus. 16 new cases are being traced back to kids playing together. These are the first new infections in the tribe in weeks. Dr. Dakota Lane, the Lummi Nation's health director, confirmed the new cases to the Seattle Times. Tribal officials say after going weeks without any new infections, people became complacent and didn't continue to follow social distancing orders. The Lummi Nation put into place a strict stay-at-home order on March 22nd. It's now being extended through the end of May. In addition, a nightly curfew is in effect from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. Dr. Lane said, quote, you feel things are going well, and then boom, this happens. The reservation is less than 100 miles north of Seattle, and there are more than 5,000 tribal members. 31 states are starting to partially reopen, and that's not good news according to the Center for American Progress. The Research Institute is releasing its guidelines and recommendations for states to safely reopen. It says currently no state meets the thresholds of incidents and testing needed to hold off future outbreaks. Incidents marks the rate of occurrence of new cases. Rhode Island is the only state that meets the testing threshold, but it does not meet the incidence threshold. The study warns that reopening before adequate test kits are available and the number of positive cases is reduced will only cause a substantial second wave of infections and in turn, another economic shutdown. The Center for American Progress is a nonpartisan research and education institute. The Yakima Nation in Washington put in place a stay home, stay healthy order in March, and Chairman Delano Salskin says the tribal order will remain in effect regardless of what the state does. Ronnie Washins, managing editor of the Yakima Nation Review, reports that three Yakima tribal members have died due to COVID-19. One man apparently came in contact with the virus at a feast ceremony held during the Easter weekend. The chairman says Yakima County has the highest infection rate per capita in the state. He thanked the health workers who are conducting tests, and he directed tribal police to increase the enforcement of the stay home, stay healthy order and to issue citations if necessary. He's also directing tribal prosecutors to fully prosecute all violators. The chairman is also urging tribal members to have faith and pray, saying the creator, quote, will do his part and we must do our part to meet him halfway. The circle of life is real. For the latest on the number of positive COVID tests in Indian country, let's go to Jordan Bennett Begay, our Washington editor. Jordan? Yate Patty, Yate Shike Sado Shidene. So as of this morning, there are a total of 3,000. 328 positive confirmed cases and 104 deaths within the Indian health system. Again, that is 3,328 cases and 104 deaths that Indian country today is tracking. And a lot of these uh, cases did come from a Choctaw Nation. They had an increase of 11 cases. Um, Blackfeet Nation up north also saw one death of a tribal member. And um, this tribal member was living off the reservation up there. And Navajo Nation did also see an increase of cases um, in their community, Patty. Well, we also know that the border towns for the Navajo Nation, Gallup and Farmington, had um, a, a lockdown this weekend and prevented people from coming into those two communities. What have we heard about the outcome of uh, Gallup? Yes, we don't have the number of citations for um, Gallup yet or even the curfew there in Navajo Nation, but Gallup did say they are extending their lockdown until Thursday, May 7th. And so the businesses will be closed you know, every day from 5 p.m. to 8 a.m. the next day, and only two people are allowed in each vehicle um, with this extended lockdown. And that's for anyone going into the town of Gallup, New Mexico? Yes, this is for anybody going to Gallup in New Mexico. And as far as we know, um, you know, the freeway is also being closed. So they're directing people to go around and take in the back roads um, in order to get back on the freeway to continue um, on the I Interstate 40 there. Interstate 40 is a huge thoroughfare. And by redirecting people, that's bringing up some more issues. So we'll continue to follow this story. Um, Jordan Benabigay, our Washington editor, thank you very much. Thank you, Patty. And we'll be right back.
Welcome back. Our guest today is Brian Newland, and he is the chairperson of the Bay Mills Indian Community in Northern Michigan. Welcome, uh, Chairperson Newland. Thank you for joining us. Ani, uh, hello, Patty, miigwech. Thank you for having me here. You instituted a pretty strict stay home order back in March and, um, and really didn't uh, play around with that because it was in effect, it is in effect for 90 days. What caused you to put into effect such a long stay at home order? You know, we, uh, we talked with our health team and we were actually reading health experts from around the world, anything we could get our hands on. And uh, the ultimate or conclusion or most consistent advice we found at that time was start off really aggressive. You can always uh, scale back on your uh, restrictions uh, once you have them in place. But if you're too tentative and this virus uh, finds its way into your community, it's really too late to stop it at that point before it inflicts a uh, terrible amount of damage. So uh, we really worked through social media and uh, you know, the informal uh, network that uh, we have in all of our tribal communities to educate our people about what we were planning to do, what we knew, what we didn't know, what we were basing our decision on. And then we put that into effect. It, it, it included a shelter in place order for 90 days, as you said, but it also uh, included a curfew uh, because we, we felt like most of the essential businesses uh, that were still open were closed by 10 p.m. Uh, and really, if you were out after 10 o'clock, it's either a medical emergency, you're on your way to essential work, or you're doing something else uh, to put other people at risk. And so we, we added that layer of protection as well. You have a um, little more than 2,000 tribal members there. How have they responded to this very strict stay-at-home order? Um, it's been pretty good for the most part. Uh, it, it helps that we live so far north and the weather is usually, uh, you know, you're not wanting to get outside in March and, and April, but uh, with the sunshine coming out uh, and uh, not, so, not any confirmed cases in our community yet, uh, it's been a challenge more recently. I think, you know, people are getting cabin fever and restless and, and wanting to get outside and enjoy the sun. Uh, we have found, though, that it has been the most helpful just to, uh, from the tribal council perspective, to show all of our cards. Uh, here's what we know, here's what we don't, here's what's informing our decision-making process. Uh, and to be just honest and transparent and very candid with people uh, right up front. And that has helped uh, tamp down a lot of rumors uh, about the decision to put a shelter in place order in effect um, and really help people understand why it's important. And we've just tried to uh, constantly repeat that messaging and educate people on why we are taking these steps. And you included in, in your order a special line concerning elders. Can you tell us about that? Uh, well, we have a we have a couple of uh, parts uh, of that related to elders, so I'm not uh, sure exactly which line you're referring to, but we have a tribally owned grocery store uh, that uh, right off the bat, we uh, limited the first hours of the day after it had been cleaned and sanitized overnight, where our elders could come in and shop for their supplies uh, without having to worry about coming into contact with others. They knew at that point nobody had been in the store. Uh, before them so they had a nice clean sanitized store to come into and we've kept that in place and it, uh, it's been uh, pretty successful so far. Yes, I, a lot of stores are opening up for like an hour earlier or such but um, mm -hmm. with your small community you put into place a two-hour shopping time frame yeah. for elders. Um, you also mentioned domestic violence and that if people were in a situation that was not safe that they should call for help. Yeah. Yeah, it, you know, one of the one of the things that's been very challenging uh, with the shelter in place order is understanding that we have to still continue to provide services for our people who are at risk, um, uh, children and uh, adults and elders living in abusive homes, uh, people who are uh, suffering from mental health issues and substance abuse, and really these times become. Uh, actually increase the risk of those problems uh, becoming more harmful 
And so we've tried to pay special attention to meeting the needs of, of you know, folks at risk or who might otherwise be marginalized in our community. Actually, before we even put our shelter in place order into effect, uh, the tribal council had directed our prosecutor to file a motion with our tribal court to have all of our inmates taken out of the county jail, uh, which is where our tribal inmates go, and placed on house arrest. And we've uh, suspended taking people to jail unless uh, somebody is a, you know, imminent danger to public safety and trying to look out for those folks who aren't always at the forefront of the minds of policymakers. That's, that's a, quite the act of tribal sovereignty to bring back, to get the people out from jail, to bring them home. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Again, you know, we, we, we read up as much as we could. We, uh, not just myself, but our whole council and the folks who advise us. And, you know, we said, we, let's, let's be aggressive right out of the, right out of the gate before this virus makes its way here. And we knew that with having people in jail, uh, if a virus were to ever show up in jail or prison, as we've seen in a lot of places, there's no place, there's nothing you can do to really keep it from spreading at that point. And, uh, you know, through our tribal court, there were, very few crimes that were worth keeping people at risk of losing their lives. And, uh, you know, the, the, the need was the need to keep them safe outweighed, you know, any desire to uh, inflict further punishment right now. Well, I think that's, you know, that's a quite a testament again to um, your background as a lawyer and as a judge to understand looking out for the community at large. A lot of people may not be even thinking about, uh, yeah. tribal um, members who are incarcerated. Yeah, we've tried to um, really focus again on, on on everybody in our community. And uh, really, as a council, we set three overarching priorities right now. And everything we do, we've, we've agreed has to tie back to those three priorities, which are keeping our tribal uh, public health uh, well, keeping people safe, uh, taking care of our employees, both their wages and their safety, and then protecting the tribe's long-term economic interests. And it's been very difficult with some of these decisions to uh, marry up those three goals, but we have, we have said everything we do has to tie back to those three goals right now and has to fulfill those objectives. And how does that tie into the philosophy of looking out, making decisions that are, are beneficial to, in, in, to the next seven generations, because right. you even talk about that. Yeah, so uh, for example, with our casino employees, we made the decision uh, a month ago to lay off uh, almost all of them or put them on unpaid leave status. Uh, and that was, that was simply because we wanted to ensure that we had the funds you know, we could have spent down our uh, limited funds uh, to continue paying people for a few extra weeks, but then we would have nothing left to uh, restart our tribal government or keep things going on the other side of this. And we've we've worked really hard to explain to people the trade-offs and the decisions that we're making. And it's it's almost become a mantra for me in communicating with our, our tribal members um, that the council doesn't have good choices here. You, you know, we're not choosing between right and wrong or good and bad. Uh, often right now we're choosing between bad and worse, and it's not always easy to understand that. But uh, with, with placing employees on unpaid leave, uh, we've tried to help them. Uh, we've taken our human resources department and <laughs> turned it into an unemployment assistance department and help them get their unemployment benefits and explain very clearly that this is to protect the tribe's long-term uh, health so that our children and, and my grandchildren, when they come uh, into this world at some point, uh, you know, that, that our tribe as a, as a government, as a sovereign uh, tribal state, tribal nation uh, exists for their benefit. And so that thought, that's a thought process about looking mm-hmm. at what decisions are made today that will protect yeah. seven generations from now. Yeah. So the, um, the casino closed, you have two different locations and, um, and now they're also not scheduled to be open possibly until July. Uh, our, our current closure order extends until May 15th and we're looking at 
um, uh, you know, two to three week increments uh, based on testing. Um, and it, it, it becomes a challenge because in Michigan, we have three commercial casinos in the city of Detroit that the governor has jurisdiction over. And then of course there are 12 tribes here that operate a number of casinos. And we understand that, you know, when one tribe this makes the decision to move forward, uh, you know, Indian country, we're always watching each other and we know that's going to put pressure on others uh, to make a similar decision. And again, we've worked really hard to communicate with our people to say, we are going to exercise our own sovereignty. We're going to make our own decisions based on our own review of, of the tests that we get uh, and what our professionals tell us. But we've also worked hard with other tribal leaders around the state uh, to be very candid with one another about what our plans are so that nobody uh, was tempted to take advantage of the situation to try to get the market to themselves for a little bit. And in a way it's been refreshing because uh, tribes, you know, we can, we compete with one another in the gaming industry. Uh, but it's almost back to that old way of we're just Indians looking out for each other. And uh, we've been talking uh, about what are we going to do uh, to reopen safely and, and it's been really nice. Yeah, well, that's uh, that certainly is. Again, it's like uh, cooperation in the time of COVID. Yeah, like, you know, cooperation yeah, exactly. in the time of COVID, something like <laughs> that. Uh, but you know, that's a. It's important to to look to each other and and see you know what what is the safest route, and and then how do you yeah. how do you reopen? What changes do you see coming in your casino as you? do plan some uh, reopening? Well, I think first of all, uh, you know, people shouldn't take for granted that if you open your doors that uh, people are going to flood back in. Uh, so safety is going to be another uh, amenity that casinos are going to have to offer. You know, people are going to need to feel safe coming through the doors. Uh, I think the days of uh, casino buffets are probably behind us. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we are really going to, I don't want to say right off the year, but this is not going to be a normal year. And so we're going to focus on, uh, again, those three goals that I described earlier, keeping our, our tribal community safe, our employees safe, uh, and protecting the tribe's future. And, you know, we'll work backwards from there. Uh, so specific changes might be, uh, you know, reserving the gaming floor to VIPs, uh, since VIPs tend to uh, generate a, a huge portion of any gaming business's revenues. Um, other things like limiting hotel rooms. Uh, before we made the decision to close, we uh, prohibited any uh, tour buses from stopping in because you, you know, you're bringing people who've been in a confined space for you know long periods of time. Uh, you know, I think table games are going to be really different coming out of this. Uh, there's so many different options, and, and that's one of the benefits of having these conversations with other tribal leaders is everybody can bring their good ideas to the forefront and, and talk about them. Has the, has the discussion of opening up smoke-free come in, uh, been raised at, in some of these discussions, or do you anticipate that? And I ask because, again, we're seeing more studies about how um, uh, viruses can be carried on cigarette smoke. Yeah, that you know we were we were discussing uh, going smoke free before this started, uh, and that's certainly going to play a role in it. I, I suspect, uh, Patty, that when we reopen our casino, uh, it's going to start on a very limited basis, uh, probably with our our premium players, um, and and you know that'll keep the gaming floor pretty wide open for them. Uh, and then we have several different gaming floors that are two facilities here. Uh, we've kicked around the idea of having one that's just for elders, you know, people uh, 55 and older, uh, one uh, gaming floor just for locals, um, you know, the, who want to get out and gamble. And then our main gaming floor for VIPs. Uh, we're, we have really talked to our staff about, uh, get us no idea is too silly to to talk about and, and no idea is too bad to kick around um, and think about implementation. So it's you know, we're all we're looking at every possible way we could reopen safely. 
Wow. Well, certainly that's going to uh, create a lot of discussion in, in the days and months yeah. to come here and how, how do casinos safely reopen. Um, and then in terms of diversification, what other uh, industries does your tribe operate that uh, are affected by the coronavirus? Uh, I mean, you know, we closed on, or, or excuse me, we held our grand opening for our grocery store literally the day we went into quarantine. Oh. Um, it was that was a deal we had been working on for a long time, so that's been affected. Um, you know, we have a gas station. We actually through our our tribal college, we have uh, a skilled trades training program, uh, which is uh, you know gets people ready for manufacturing, and they've partnered up with local school districts uh, to um, make medical face shields uh, with their 3D printers, and uh, you know students doing assembly. Uh, so that's, uh, we've pumped out thousands of face shields to uh, local hospitals and, and other healthcare providers in the region. Um, our tribal fishers, we're a treaty fishing tribe. Um, ordinarily in tough times, uh, when the economy is bad, people go back to those old ways of, uh, you know, getting out on Lake Superior and the other Great Lakes and harvesting fish. Uh, but with restaurants and bars being closed, uh, it's very difficult to get those fish to market. And so our fishers have been impacted. And uh, we've been very frustrated actually with the federal response to that Congress appropriated uh, money to assist commercial fishers in the CARES Act. And we have yet to even uh, hit, take a phone call from NOAA asking uh, if we're ready to consult or how to get those monies out to fishers. Um, you know, there's this, the downstream impacts of this outbreak of, uh, it's hard to get our arms around it still. And you're, um, are you still waiting for any, any of the money from the $8 billion allocated to tribes in the CARES uh, Act? Yeah, we haven't seen a, a, a dime of that. And that's also been frustrated because when you're planning to, um, you know, try to take this path from where we are today to something that's going to be with, you know, the new normal, as they say, you, know, you have to know what resources you're working with. And we don't know how much money our, sh our tribe is going to get from that uh, CARES Act funding, and we can't finalize our plans. So you, know, you, you see the president on the news saying, America has to reopen again. Well, we can't finalize our plans until they follow the law and get the money that Congress appropriated the tribes. Uh, it's been, uh, to call it frustrating would be an understatement. Yeah, well, there's so many angles to talk about. And the other angle is just um, the protests at the state capitol to reopen mm -hmm. the state um, in comparing that with some of the protests that uh, took place uh, about over the No Dapple movement. Can you compare and contrast the two protests? Yeah, it, you know, it, I was a little bit embarrassed to see the protests here in Michigan, um, you know, being, you know, this is where we're from. Um, but you're absolutely right. I mean, we have, we've been engaged in our own uh, pipeline battle uh, with Enbridge, uh, having a pipeline crossing underneath the Great Lakes. And the, uh, the difficulty we've had uh, just having our voices heard, and even then you have to watch almost the tone that you speak with. And here these guys can march right into the legislative chambers with automatic rifles or semi-automatic assault rifles, excuse me, um, and scream and yell without any repercussions is is very frustrating. Yeah, so very a very big difference between the two protests yeah. there. Um, and finally, what is your what are your plans for the community college's graduation? Well, we postponed that. Um, hopefully, with summer coming, and uh, we are doing uh, surveillance testing for COVID, which is different than what a lot of other places are doing. Just taking random samples. Uh, every week in our community and doing testing. Uh, as, that, as those results come back, it, we can keep a closer eye on this virus in our community. Uh, we hope to maybe get to a point where we can have some of these gatherings like graduations uh, in outdoor settings and keep people further apart, but still celebrate people for their accomplishments. Yes, and in two quick or three words, you know, what's the new normal when we reopen? What do you see that new normal as being? Um, hygiene, masks, 
and respect for other people's space. Very forward. good. <laughs> well, we really thank you uh, for joining us today, Brian Newland. He's the chairperson of the Bay Mills Indian Community. Thank you so much for joining us. And miigwech. Thank you for having me. And thank you for joining us. Uma umukatsi ukalyani. Take care of yourselves. Your life is precious. I'm Patty Tolohungva. Join us again tomorrow. This is Indian Country Today.